iron-eyed, report to me at once. Prime, every time I look into a monitor, my circuit sizzle. When are we gonna start building up our design chops? Nothing to it but to do it, my man. Come on, Big Daddy, stop talking in riddles. I want you to design a new Autobot insignia for the assault on the Decepticons' base. Run a search for FYA on the humans' YouTube. I found it, Prime. Your days are numbered now, Decepticreeps. Alright guys, welcome or welcome back to the channel and thanks for dropping by. In this session, I'll walk you through the construction and rendering process for my redesigned Autobot insignia in Affinity Designer 2 for iPad. But before we get started, I did a bit of research and took a few notes which I'd like to share with you. I hope you find them as interesting as I do. According to the Transformers Wiki, the original insignias were designed for Hasbro by a man named Wayne Molinaire. Mr. Molinaire was also responsible for the packaging designs, layouts for the character bios, character tech specs, and the original branding logos for the US launch of the Transformers toy line, which was based on Takara's Diaclone and Microchange toys. I was surprised to learn that the Autobot and Decepticon insignias were based on the heads of characters Prowl or Blue Streak and Soundwave, respectively. I had never noticed this as a kid, but a side-by-side -side comparison made it pretty obvious. Looking further into it, it seems Mr. Molinaire also played a major role in the relaunch of Hasbro's G.I. Joe toy line. After reading this, it suddenly hit me. Excluding He-Man, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and a smattering of other cartoon-driven toys I was familiar with, this man practically designed half of my childhood. I guess I should say, thanks Mr. Molinaire. I also tracked down the artist responsible for these beautifully rendered versions of the original insignias which I used as references throughout my process. They were made by War God Arts, who happens to have a pretty cool Deviant Art page. I'll leave a link to it in the description below. Interestingly enough, while skimming across the Transformers wiki, I learned that the Autobot insignia had already been given the Angry Eye treatment back in 2007 for the release of the live action movies. It's okay, I guess, true enough to the original, but the change is so subtle, it's almost unnoticeable. As for my own redesign, I was after something noticeably more aggressive. After my initial examination, I sketched out my first two drafts. I accidentally deleted my first one before I could save it. What you see here is my second draft. I thought it was interesting, but a little cat-like somehow and not quite right, perhaps due to the exaggerated angle of the crests. The original is sort of shaped like a policeman's badge. I thought it was important that this general shape remain in place so that my design could evoke similar associations. After thinking on this a while, I came back to the original design to take a closer look at its angles and symmetry. While moving the protractor around, I started to take more notice of the vertices and their placement in relation to certain angles. Initially, I thought the center of the design lay just between the eyes, on the same horizon as the brow line. I was very surprised to see that by moving the protractor down a few millimeters, many of the vertices fell along angles radiating in increments of 10 degrees. I thought this was really cool. It was like I'd found some kind of secret code left behind by Molinaire. After my analysis, I went back to the drawing board and worked up my third draft, which you can see here. Then, I analyzed my drawing and started developing a plan of attack. In my design, I wanted to use a slight angle for the brow line to give it a more aggressive or determined look. I also wanted to break up the vertical lines that ran down the face, which always evoked images of tears or crying for me. Thinking about what Molinaire may have done with 10 degree increments in his design, I imagine using 17 degree increments in a similar way for mine. In the end, however, fewer of the vertices in my design actually fell along such angles, but I was pleased enough with the result that I felt good about moving on to the construction phase of the project.
For this project, I created a document based on the measurements I took with my rulers while studying and planning. As both the original and my own design fit within a 12 cm square, I reasoned that a 24 cm square would give me ample room to work. This allowed me to easily set up a 1cm grid for the project, which I used to help me with horizontal and vertical measurements. I added subdivisions of 10 to the grid to help with measurements in millimeters. This also gave me plenty of snapping targets when it came time to block in shapes with the pen tool. After that, I added a vertical guide to the project to aid in achieving precise symmetry later on. Next, using the rectangle tool, I drew out a 12 cm square and centered it to the spread. This was simply to delineate the area in which I would begin construction. Finally, as I had previously saved my notes, reference, and draft to an asset library, I brought them into the project and centered my draft to the spread. In the beginning, I just wanted to quickly get the shapes onto the spread using the pen tool in polygon mode. Polygon mode is very useful as it allows us to draw angular shapes without fear of accidentally bending or curving our line segments while drawing. Placing the tip of our pencil just ahead of the last node we've placed, we can simply draw out a line much like we can in line mode. In polygon mode, however, we can draw continuously to complete the shape. This feels very natural, almost like drawing with a pencil, only this has the added benefit of giving us perfectly straight lines every single time. Using this approach, it's helpful to work without a grid or snapping so that the shapes can be quickly and loosely thrown onto the spread. After all the shapes are in place, we can turn on our grid and snapping options and sculpt the shapes to our liking with the node tool. During this phase, I was faced with a tough decision concerning my angles. Should I struggle without the grid to make sure my angles are precise? Or should I let the grid dictate the value of each angle and accept the slight deviations that occur as a result? Although I wanted to dive more deeply into this area of study and draftsmanship, for the sake of expedience, I opted to keep it simple and rely on the grid. As a result, many of my angles deviated very slightly from those in my original plan, and some were altered intentionally during my final editing passes. In the end, I didn't stray too far from my original plan, and I was pleased enough with the resulting shapes to continue the project with confidence and enthusiasm. After I got half of the Insignia space shapes blocked in properly, I converted the vector layer to a symbol from the Symbol Studio. Then, I brought another instance of the symbol onto the spread, where I proceeded to flip it horizontally and align it to the original layer to complete the design's symmetry. I've been asked several times in the past why I use this technique as it seems to complicate things a bit. Why not just duplicate and flip? Essentially, this technique cuts one's work in half. If I decide to make changes to one side, those changes are mirrored in the synced symbol precisely and immediately. This spares me the tedium of performing actions twice. Working this way is also beneficial because it allows us to see how our changes present in real time, which can help us make judgments and decisions as we progress through our work. This virtually eliminates the risk of tiny deviations or accidental node placements that can destroy the symmetry of the design. In other words, by perfecting the half, we have perfected the whole. Now that the symbols are present in the layer stack, they'll remain there for the duration of the project and will help a great deal in the next phase. In this phase of the work, I began adding the shapes that create the 3D effect. I went about this phase in much the same way as I did when constructing the components that make up the Insignia's face. 
With the snapping toggled off, I laid down all the basic shapes first using the pen tool in polygon mode. Then I toggled the grid and snapping options back on and refined the shapes using the node tool. This time, however, I used both the grid and nodes belonging to the previously drawn vector shapes as snapping targets. Lastly, I separated the components into two groups, one for the face and one for the 3D components. With the symbols in place, this work went relatively quickly aside from the time that it took to make decisions about the placement of certain nodes. Once I was satisfied with the symmetry and shape placements, I moved to the Symbol Studio to toggle the syncing off. This allows for changes to be made to an instance of a symbol without it affecting the other instances. I did this because I wanted to harvest the components of the second instance of the symbol to help me create a compound object. So, once the symbols were no longer synced, I gathered all of the components that make up the face and removed them from their respective layers. After that, using Boolean operations, I began to fuse all of the objects which fell upon the line of symmetry. I wasn't worried about destructive editing because I'd taken several snapshots along the way. I knew I could always go back if things started to go south. Once the center objects were fused, I gathered the other components and created a compound to complete the insignia's face. I'd anticipated that having the whole of the face combined into a single shape would make placing my gradients less complicated. However, I'd forgotten the simple fact that we cannot clip vector objects to compound objects and expect them to become child layers. They will merely become part of the compound. So, eventually, I duplicated the compound and converted it to curves so that I could place my gradients when the time actually came. I was so excited for this part. The gradients are the key element that really give the design its iconic 80s metal look. Right away, I could see that the wavy horizon line separating the blue from the red would be the trickiest part of the task. So I decided to overlap two curve objects, each with their own gradient. This allowed me to incorporate the wavy horizon line into the foremost curve object. I used the knife tool to simply slice out a wavy section of the rectangle. I think it worked out nicely. Constantly checking my reference, I could see that an inner stroke or inner glow of white was also called for along the edges of the insignia's faceplate. This was easily achieved by adding an inner glow effect from the effects studio. After the gradients were in place, I mustered up the courage to place the cutouts in the crest and forehead area. The method for achieving this is fairly simple. I used the symbols to create the components, combined them, and then subtracted them from the faceplate using Boolean operations. I was determined to deviate from the two parallelograms present in the original design. I really wanted to keep the angled wing-shaped slot that I'd incorporated into my redesigned version. While the triangular shape on the forehead was pretty straightforward, getting the shape of the slots on the crests just right was a bit of a challenge. Eventually, these shapes and their mirrored counterparts were sculpted and placed just how I'd imagined. As soon as I got them in place, they were subtracted from the faceplate. Lastly, I set about creating the gradients present on the 3D components of the design. This part was really tricky as I couldn't really decide what colors to use. I realized that as metallic surfaces are meant to appear reflective, the colors used would depend on the setting in which the insignia would be placed. In the end, I basically spent a lot of time making subtle little changes here and there to get the shapes and their gradients looking correct. I gave it a good try with some dark, almost black blues and gray tones. I played with it for a while and wasn't really thrilled with it, but decided to bring the project to a close and move on to the next adventure. This project was loads of good fun and learning, and it brought back a lot of memories. 
While working on this, I could almost hear my fifth grade homeroom teacher carrying on with her lesson while I scribbled out drawings of Hot Rod and Grimlock onto the crumpled pieces of paper in my Trapper Keeper. In a way, it was like reliving my childhood and living out a childhood daydream all at the same time. Aside from the nostalgia trip, I learned a lot while working on this project. Specifically, I expanded my knowledge and general awareness of angles, grids, project dimensions, and units of measurement. I also felt good about the general ease with which the project was completed. I'm left feeling more confident and eager to learn more about logo and insignia design in general. Anyhow, I hope you guys had as much fun watching as I had creating, filming, and editing. As always, thanks again for dropping by and watching the video, dropping the likes, and for the support and positivity in the comments. Remember to take care of yourselves, keep working hard, and stay positive.